This program was first broadcast on Canterbury's access media station, Plains FM, and was made with the assistance of New Zealand On Air. It's time for Emergence News on Plains FM 96.9, Citizen Made Radio. Welcome to Emergence News. Kia ora. Welcome. It's great to have your company. This is a program where we cover the subject of a master of wisdom. His name is Maitreya. He is the head of the spiritual hierarchy and he is our main focus. So when we're talking about a variety of subjects, it's usually in relationship to him, the work that he is doing and the emergence of his presence here on planet Earth. He has a number of priorities such as sufficient housing, health, education for all. It's a human right, basically. And one of the other priorities which is really important, particularly in the last 50 years, is climate change and our environment. And here in New Zealand, we're broadcasting to you from Christchurch in New Zealand, which is in the South Island. Here in this country, recently, climate scientist Dr. Jim Salinger has been named New Zealander of the Year. Woof. Yeah. He is recognised as one of the first scientists to address global warming and advancing climate change for over 50 years. He began his pioneering research into southern hemisphere climate change way back in the 1970s, John, when it wasn't popular to do no, so. No, but in 1977, as we know, Nigel, the fossil fuel companies, uh, Xen- Xenon, Mobil, no, Xenon it was then, their lead scientist knew then that they are burning of fossil fuels would pollute our planet. And ever since then, they've been in a rearguard action. They've been fighting tooth and nail to cling to their millions, billions, I should say, billions. So Dr. Jim Salinger would have been uh, not a comfortable gentleman to be around in those business meetings and with those people. And, of course, he's been an interesting character. He's a renowned communicator on climate change extremes, uh, on subjects such as droughts, and the shrinking ice volume in the New Zealand Southern Alps, because remember, his focus is on the Southern Hemisphere. He was the lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change back in 2007. Ah, interesting. Now, what I didn't know was that that was collectively awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. I didn't know that. No. Uh, Stick stick nice and close to that microphone, John, so we can hear you. Yeah. Um, That intergovernmental panel on climate change was prepared in 2018, following the signing of the 2016 Paris Agreement. Salinger noted the difference between the impacts of 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees, and that the impact and the difference is literally earth-shattering. For example, the coral reefs would decline by 70 to 90 percent, with global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius and more than 99% lost with two degrees. So that gives you an idea of the impact. Now, he he was the lead researcher on those subjects. So when you hear people like Greta Thunberg uh, bringing those figures out and talking those subjects, he is one of the key people. He would have been one of the... He would have been providing key research for people and, and, and spokespeople that are talking about these subjects. The New Zealand Institute of Water and Atmosphere Research, better known as NIWA, mm-hmm. uh, he, he, they confirmed those projection, projections back in 2018. In 2019, Salinger issued a press release outside New Zealand Parliament. Including in that statement, he said, though the response to COVID-19, we have set... Th- uh, since the, the uh, COVID-19 response, we have seen the power of the people act as a collective. It is now time to see climate action and climate justice, and it's time for action by all. Salinger urged for support to farmers in switching to regenerative agriculture so that New Zealand will not be seen as a global perpetrator. 
due to their huge emissions. So he's not going to be popular with a number of people in New Zealand here. No, no. So it's quite interesting that he, in 2024, has been named, well, for 2023 really, was named New Zealander of the Year. I was Mm. absolutely... (laughs) Because I've, I've been aware of this guy through much of his career because I worked for over 22 years in broadcasting. And, mm-hmm. of course, we interviewed him a lot mm-hmm. over the years because his comments and viewpoints were of great value. And when he was – we would not only talk to the Met service but also to Niwa mm-hmm. to just to get different viewpoints. Mm-hmm. And Dr. Jim Salinger was often the media spokesperson. Mm. A question was put to Jim Salinger, how hopeful are you of the future of our planet? I'll just finish on this. He says, very hopeful. We have got to reduce our energy use and transfer to renewables. There is much that can be done in houses through passive design. You'll have a comment Mm, on that. You you, uh, you were house hunting recently, weren't you? Uh Passive design, what does that mean? Um, So there's a number of ways you can approach housing and, you know, Peter will be able to chime in. Well, Peter, you've been a builder since 1960. You'll be up on this. Yes, a few years. One of the things you can do is you either, you you design a home to make it airtight so that you can control the air quality and temperature within the house or you design a house that by its design, um, airflow and control of airflow manages the temperatures within. So um, there's a couple – so you can do it either mechanically. So an airtight home, you can um, control it mechanically so you've got air conditioning type systems or you build a more kind of maybe a softer approach where the house itself allows airflow. But quality of housing and the right housing is one of my tray's key Uh, principles, key processes. Priorities. Yeah. And in New Zealand, um, we've got poor um, insulation standards compared to global best practice. Um, But without much tweaking, you can improve that. So um, I would advise all New Zealanders to have a look at their insulation quality of their home. Insulation quality. And also, uh, I think a key point you just mentioned was airflow. Mm. Yeah. It's really critical. And so any... any, um, systems that are installed in the home, make sure the filters are cleaned regularly yep. and updated by your landlord, yep. and also make sure that uh, the house meets the healthy home standards, yeah. which uh, I thought was a good move by uh, our previous government. Yes, building standards were improved last year, Peter, wasn't it? May, March, May they're, last year? They're, they're improving all the time. It's, it's a mission to keep up with them. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and the insulation standards in New Zealand were improved last year for new builds. So we are moving in that direction. Yeah, Jim, Jim Salinger says, John, that to capture sunlight, increasing insulation and reduction in power use, good public transport, and the introduction of either hybrid or electric vehicles. So, you know, he's way ahead of his oh, time, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, he could sit in this room with us. He could. We'd have a good conversation mm. with the man. In yeah. fact, it, it, wouldn't it be great to have... Mm. Yeah, it'd be great to sort of come and ring and see if he's interested. We'd probably have to stop talking, wouldn't we? (laughs) (laughs) And listen. (laughs) The plummeting cost of renewable energy production through solar solar panels and wind turbines is fast becoming a reality. Mm. So, you know, um, he was. He was a man ahead of his time, and it was always a pleasure to talk to him. Mm -hmm. He was always – he almost – he was almost honoured. Mm-hmm that the media would want to speak to him and that he he could talk about what he was passionate about. Mm. Mm. All right, John, what are you covering today? Okay, well, I'm talking about someone that we've talked about before. On the previous program, Krishnamurti. Yes, who who has an interesting relationship with Maitreya. And I'm lucky enough and I do feel blessed that I have – Krishnamurti's three notebooks, three journals. Uh, He wrote sporadically um, journals over his career, over his life, and I wanted to talk about a specific part of his life. So I'm going to give a little teaser here. Here's Krishnamurti. Woke up about two and there was a peculiar pressure and the pain was more acute, more in the centre of the head. It lasted over an hour and one woke up several times with the intensity of the pressure. Each time there was a great expanding ecstasy, 
This joy continued. Again, sitting in the dentist chair, waiting, suddenly the pressure began. The brain became very quiet, quivering, fully alive. Every sense was alert. The eyes were seeing the bee on the window, the spider, the birds, and the violet mountains in the distance. They were seeing, but the brain was not recording them. One could feel the quivering brain, something tremendously alive, vibrant, and so not merely recording. The pressure and the pain was great, and the body must have gone off into a doze. Okay, there's a quite lengthy teaser from John. Mm. Um, What's interesting about these notebooks was you mentioned that there were two notebooks of Krishnamurti. Three. But there's actually three, isn't yeah. it? Yes, yeah. because you've been unpacking. Yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. I think originally when we talked about it a couple of programs ago, I said three, and then I went home and I could only find two. Uh, and now in my unpacking frenzy, I've found the third one, so I'm really excited, really happy. Yes, yes, he's a very interesting character. And he aligns perfectly with the emergence of Maitreya. Mm-hmm. Look, looking forward to this. And Peter, welcome to the studio. Thank you. Um, yeah. Peter, what are you looking at today? Well, I've got a master's message here uh, on the futility of war. And also, I wanted to cover something on this amazing child prodigy. And uh, if we're looking for third-degree initiates, she's obviously one. Back with more on Emergence News in just a moment. Looking forward to the content of this program. This is Emergence News. Thanks for joining us. And if you ever want to listen back to this program, you can try Plains FM website which is based in Christchurch, or you go to Share International, the New Zealand website, and though our podcasts are posted there, as well as Spotify. Over to you, John, the subject of Krishnamurti and his personal journals, his notebooks. Yes, well, I'm going to cover this topic over a couple of programs. So um, there is a lot of information, but once again, um, I've got a number of Krishnamurti's books, but also he is mentioned often by Benjamin Krem, and he's, he's featured in a number of Benjamin Krem's books. And I know, Peter, one of the ones you get to quite often is My Transmission, Volume 2 and 3, That's and right. Krishnamurti's mentioned in there. I also went to the Share International website, and they've got a couple of great articles about Krishnamurti uh, written by Bet Stockbauer who's got a real interest in theosophy and in the Maitreya story. So I'm relying on her, and I've started with The Pathless Journey of Jiddu Krishnamurti. And Bet Stockbar tells us that as early as 1889, Helena Blavatsky, the founder of the Theosophical Society, had told certain of her students that the purpose of theosophy was to prepare humanity for the coming of the Lord Maitreya, the world teacher for the Aquarian Age. After Blavatsky's death, Annie Besant and C.W. Ledbetter considered it their task to carry on this work, part of which was the preparation of a disciple who would serve as a vehicle for the teacher when he came. In 1909 at Adyar, India, Ledbetter discovered a boy whose aura he judged to be completely free of selfishness. This was Jiddu Krishnamurti, who was 13 years old. He was adopted by Besant and Leadbetter. He received intensive training, then 10 years of schooling in England. People in many countries were informed of his future role. At the age of 27, Krishnamurti had a personal vision which convinced him that the consciousness of Maitreya was beginning to overshadow him. Theosophists throughout the world had been waiting for this development. But when he was 34, Krishnamurti renounced his association with the Theosophical Society, declaring, I do not want followers. My only concern is to set men absolutely, unconditionally free. He spent the rest of his years teaching humanity how to achieve that freedom. So we know that um, he was being prepared. And he's had this experience in 1922, experienced a vision that would redirect his his life. And he had been, for two weeks, he meditated constantly, envisaging, envisaging the image of Maitreya. He 
He then began to experience extreme pain in his neck and spine and long periods of delirium. Day and night he struggled, unable to sleep or eat, often leaving his body, often seeing visionary happenings. On the third evening, he was drawn from a small cottage to sit beneath a pepper tree, alive with the fragrance of blossoms. Here's what he recorded. I had sat thus for some time. I felt myself going out of my body. I saw myself sitting down with the delicate tender leaves of the tree over me. I was facing the east. In front of me was my body, and over my head I saw the star, bright and clear. Then I could feel the vibrations of the Lord Buddha. I beheld Lord Maitreya and Master K.H. I was so happy, calm, and at peace. I could see my body, and I was hovering near it. There was such a profound calmness, both in the air and within myself, the calmness of the bottom of a deep, unfathomable lake. The presence of the mighty beings was with me for some time, and then they were gone. I was supremely happy, for I had seen. Nothing could ever be the same. I have drunk at the clear and pure waters at the source of the fountain of life, and my thirst was appeased. I have touched compassion which heals all sorrow and suffering. It is not for myself, but for the world. I have stood on the mountaintop and gazed at the mighty beings. Love in all its glory has intoxicated my heart. My heart can never be closed. I have drunk at the fountain of joy and eternal beauty. I am God intoxicated. So he's had this experience. We know he was being prepared as a vehicle, and some of the things I'm going to talk about and read to our listeners from his notebooks, he's experiencing this tremendous preparation. His physical, mental, astral um, being is being reconstructed to accept the overshadowing of Maitreya, and it's incredibly painful for him, but he's had this experience. And at some point later on in his life, he's aware that he will no longer be the vehicle for Maitreya. But surely he would have been part of that decision-making. I suspect so. And in in some of his writings, he, he, he talks about going away. He's gone somewhere. For, mm. uh, for a meeting, I suspect. Um, and it was quite normal for him to, to sort of be sitting there but disappear, if you know what I mean. So the people around him didn't think anything of it. What is interesting about him is he came in as a third-degree initiate, and by the time he'd worked with Maitreya, he died a fourth-degree initiate. So he attained that initiation in one life. Um, Three degrees to the four fourth degree, degree initiation. Four degree initiation, yep. That's quite quite t- a lot yep. of travel. Yeah. The other thing that Kremers talked about is there were several disciples being prepared to be the vehicle for Maitreya. Does this sound familiar? Because there were several people being prepared to take Krem's role. Mm. And it was only Krem that woke. Right? And, and that was reluctant as well. And that was reluctant. So it, it, from what Krem has said, there were several people being prepared at the same time, several disciples, yeah, Krishna. and Krishnamurti is the one that somehow made the grade. But anyway, he's got a fabulously interesting story. And if you were interested in Maitreya, have a look at Krishnamurti. If you are interested in the spiritual life, have a look at, at Krishnamurti. Um, he's, I've got a whole lot of stuff here, but I'm going to delve into some of his personal experiences a bit later on. But that's it so far. That's what I'm starting with, Nigel. Looking forward to part two, John. Oh, my goodness. This is the Emergence News on Plains FM. For more information, go to shareinternational.org. This is Emergence News. We welcome you back to the program. And, John, just before we move to Peter, Krishnamurti, The Notebooks, are they, are they a publication you can get online? Look, I really don't think so. Um, I picked up my three, and he wrote three, um, just to be clear about that. Uh, and he didn't write all the time. He did it sporadically throughout his life. Uh, I picked them all up at secondhand bookshops. Um, and I, I have scoured secondhand bookshops. So what I think our listeners need to be aware of is there's an awful lot of good stuff that has been written over the last 60 or 70 years by various teachers that are no longer in print because they, get, they stop getting printed if they're not selling, right? So if they're not selling in big enough numbers, these gorgeous books don't get printed. So my recommendation is dive into your nearest secondhand bookshop. 
or, see what they've got. Or check any of those banana boxes in the garage that have yes. got lots of books packed in them. <laughs> Still got one to go. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, Peter, you're, you've got uh, a, an interesting story on a child prodigy there. This is right. And um, as we've spoken about the uh, initiation status of various um, people, uh, particularly Christian Murphy, John was talking about, came in as a third degree initiate and took the fourth degree uh, in that lifetime. This is a child who is obviously a third degree initiate to my way of thinking. She ranks equally at an early age with Mozart, who was a third degree initiate. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm basing it on. Mm -hmm. And Mozart is now a a master. Mm -hmm. He's taken um, the fifth initiation. Um, This is a story of Alma Deutscher, a child musical prodigy. She was able to name the notes on the piano at age two and began playing piano and violin at the age three. Within a year of tutoring, she was playing Handel's sonatas on the violin. By the age of four, Elma had begun composing her own melodies, and by six she had written her own first piano sonata. This was followed by a violin and orchestra concerto at age nine. In December last year, her full-length opera, Cinderella, premiered at the Casino Bell Garden Theatre in Vienna. This is obviously written some time ago, but because um, she is now, she was born in 2005, so she's probably now 18 or 19 mm-hmm. this year. But anyway, at that time, she had this two-and-a-half-hour opera being played in the Vienna Concert Hall, standing ovation everywhere. She reinvented Cinderella to be a composer rather than a uh, pretty face and um, reinvented the story of the prince looking for a melody, that for music to his, um, a melody that went with his poem that he'd written to his um, alter ego, his soul mate. Mm-hmm. Fantastic sort of story. Anyway, um, this is the... This is the the path, you might say, of an initiate because she not only can speak three languages, English, German, she was actually born in England uh, from Bassingstroke in England. Her father was a professor, obviously German, so she learnt German, Mm -hmm. she learnt English and she learnt Hebrew. So I would say, obviously, a Jewish family. Mm -hmm. She's played in Israel mm-hmm. in one of her concertos, and she uh, um, no, she actually mo- uh, modified one of Mozart's pieces, and they say that it's even better than the original. <laughs> I was just about to say the audacity of it. <laughs> I mean, they've named her as the second Mozart, and she said, "Well, actually, I'd rather be the first Elmer rather than the second." <laughs> She's quite astute, and. Um, so anyway, um, she, she considered a virtuoso on both the violin and the, and the piano. By the age of four, she began composing her own melodies, and by six, she'd written her first piano concerto and a violin and uh, orchestral concerto at nine. Um, so she is just an up-and-coming person, and... The Jewish people, of course, have, have brought some amazing people through, um, you know, talented-wise, mm. uh, intellectuals mm. and musicians and this sort of mm. thing. Well, particularly you know. musicians. Yes. Mm. And so, to me, it's interesting that um, in this time of um, problems with Israel and the Jewish people and that sort of thing, unfortunately, the um, right-wing government there is um, almost bad-mouthing Jewish people. You yeah, know, I think we need to differentiate between Judaism and Zionism. Yes, I mean, um, they're definitely the Zionists that yeah. are in charge there. Yeah. And, but to me, you know, we mustn't besmirch the name of the Jewish people. Yeah, very much. And um, so, you know, it was um, absolutely amazing to read this because I, I wasn't even aware of it. And as I say, she's now 18 or 19 and... Um, she thought, um, in, a, in her interview, she said, um, 
where does the music come from? She said, I don't really know, but it's really very normal for me to walk around having melodies popping into my head. Mm -hmm. And this is what Mozart did. He had he woke up in the morning and he had a concerto in his head. Mm -hmm. If you do any reading on some of the great composers, and I'm just talking about popular music here, not Mm -hmm. the classics. If you read anything about George Harrison, Paul McCartney, and John Lennon, they all report the same experience. Mm. Paul McCartney often talks about um, Let It Be came to me in a dream about my mother. Mm. And not just the music, but the lyrics. Mm -hmm. And John Lennon and George Harrison will... Uh, if you read any books on those guys, yeah. mm. you know they weren't they weren't the the uh, incredible music making machine that they were for no reason. They they were tapping into uh, would it be the mind belt, John? Mm. I guess the other thing that that I've that I really notice about modern musicians is that they have lost sight of the idea that they that their sum is greater than their individual parts. So they they get together, they create this phenomenal energy and this creativity, and then they separate, yeah, no. right? And they, wonder, and they wonder why as solo artists, the magic They never quite gone. make it. They never quite make it That's because right. the power is in cooperation yeah. and the power is in synthesis, yeah. right? That's right? You just see it so often. Great bands, yeah. the ego gets involved, the lead singer goes off to have a... Um, a solo career and everything just falls apart. Well, the, the, the Bee Gees is a good example oh. of that. They get back together again and they, they're even more successful. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'm not a great fan of the Rolling Stones, but when you talk, what you just said made me think of Jagger and Richards. Yeah. Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, two guys who find it really hard to get on, but they realise that the magic depended on them yes. somehow yes. making their relationship work. That's an interesting story, isn't yeah. it? Benjamin Croom has said many times in his book, The Art of Cooperation, he, he says that you don't have to like everybody, and in fact, you won't. In fact, race structures will clash. Mm. So you're not going to get on with everybody, but you've got to work with them. Mm. So you've got to be able to put that aside and follow the creative path. Another band that I used to really like was Little River Band. When, the Aussies. Glenn, when Glenn Sharrock was the lead singer. Oh, no, got to go off and have a solo career and, you know, come on, guys. He disappeared. Just disappeared. <laughs> yeah, Glenn who? So, yeah, it's, um, it's interesting to see that. And it's the new age, isn't it, Peter? It's mm. this, um, it's the energy of Aquarius, it's group endeavour, it's the sharing. The synchronicity. Of, it's yeah. the synchronicity, yep. yeah. And I think we've got to be aware that we're going to get more, m- more and more uh, of these high initiates coming in. Yes. And making a difference. You Look, know. Benjamin Krem and Maitreya have said it's the youth that will save us. Yeah. It's the new generation. And you're right, Peter, you could scour the internet and find many examples mm. of young people doing phenomenal things. Yes. I mean, uh, uh, someone with this consciousness in the political field could make yep. a complete difference to... Yes, any kind well, Greta Thunberg. Any Greta country. Thunberg's the, 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 the shining example for me. A young person who's read the research, hasn't done the research, but has read the research and has, and has decided that this is where she is going to stand. She walks the talk. Walks the talk. All this information can be found on the Share International website, www.share-international.org. And also don't forget the podcasts, which are available on the Plains FM website. We welcome your comments, questions and feedback. Please contact us at emergencenews at gmail.com. Emergency News.